Well, St. Casimir's Church was formed in 1891. And when it was formed, there's actually two other Polish churches in Cleveland area. St. Stan's was one of them. The other one is in Berea. But the uh, manufacturing that moved into this area here, from the area, um, and, and Mr. Uh, oh my gosh, now I'm going a blank here, uh, who donated the land was actually a, a German fellow. Mr. Hoffman donated the land to the church way back in the 1800s. And they wanted to have their own church because of the manufacturing that came in the area. So the folks from the area in Poznan, in the area of Poland, are the ones that came over here to work and they wanted their own church. So, the first church in 1891 looked like this. It was a wooden structure. And believe it or not, it was a school and a church. Believe it or not, in the 1930s, there was 1,200 kids going to the school in this church. What year? 1930s, 1,200 kids. Was that a, like a first or eighth grade? Or? Yeah, okay. yeah, as far as I know. But the, uh, the people wanted to have a nicer church, just a church, not a school, with a church inside the school. So this was built in 1917. So as you can see, the people from Poland gave all they had to build this church. And when it was being built, there of course was no running water at the time, back in 1917. And the artists, if you look on the railing there, you see two angels. The artists captured the faces of two children bringing water buckets up from Doan Brook to mix the mortar of the church. And those are the two angels you see there with their faces. The altar itself is made out of wood, ivory, and marble. It comes from a company in Chicago, Bovato, that's still in business, believe it or not. Our most valuable item is over to the, your right, the piata. The piata is special because, number one, the factory burned down and uh, only a few were made. And also, it has St. John with it. That's what makes it so red, left of St. John. So, uh, the church itself was closed in 2009. As many of you in Cleveland probably heard, the Bishop of Cleveland closed 55 churches in 2009. So, it was a sad day in November 2009 that the Bishop of Cleveland came right up here there was a makeshift podium set up, and he came up to speak, but he didn't realize, some of you probably heard this story before. <laughs> this is Walter Bodnick. Walter is a hero to us for a couple reasons, which I'll come back to, but he was a Polish soldier, and he was thrown into a concentration camp to die, and he escaped. He then, was thrown to Burger Belsen, where Anne Frank perished. But he lived. He didn't starve to death. He made it through the war. But he could never go back to Poland as a Polish soldier after the war ended because the Soviets took it over. He would have been thrown in the gulag again. So he came to America. He became our altar boy here at St. Casimir's of all places. And the reason I bring this up, when Bishop Lennon came to speak, is because Walter was very busy at 96 years old at the time. You see, he pulled the plug on the microphone with Fisher. Okay? You know, and as I remember it, I was here, it was mostly the ladies in the church that came from the back to the front, made the sign of the cross, and marched to the back and started singing the Polish protest solidarity songs. And that's what triggered the protests. Okay, the ladies started it off again, okay? <laughs> the ladies and Walter. But on that evening is when we believe the miracle happened. Because on that evening, Dr. Plemiak, our parishioner, had a dream. And as he points out in his dream, he quotes Matka Boja, the Polish mother of Jesus, with the dark icon version, as you see behind you over here, the Lady of Czestochowa the dark icon version of our Polish mother of Jesus, that was in his dream. So he called his friends the next day, Dr. Klemiak did, and he says, I've had this dream. 
she, Matka Boja tells me, do not abandon me, do not leave me. And his friends said to Dr. Clement, well, what can we do? It's cold, it's November, uh, the gates are locked. He says, we're going to come pray. So at 11.30 the following Sunday, folks came to pray for a miracle. This kept up weekly, rain or snow, whatever. Some of the other churches, the Irish over in Rocky River, St. Wendland, the Slovaks, Hungarian and St. Emirates, heard what was happening because their church is closed too. And they said, we want to pray too. So they would call each other, led by this gentleman here, Joe Feckenen. He would call and said, we're going to start our prayers to Mary. Okay, this kept up, like I said, 11.30 each Sunday. Well, the plain dealer and the editorials weren't too kind to us. They said, these people are crazy. Nothing's going to happen. Something happened. <laughs> First week of March, 2012, the Vatican said 13 churches are going to reopen in Cleveland. I remember where I was at the time. Dan probably remembers where he was at the time, too. Okay, we all remember. Anyways, the people came down on a warm Thursday night in March to hug each other, to cry, and to give thanks to our Blessed Mother for what is, what's going to happen when churches reopen. Okay, St. Catherine is going to be one of them to reopen. And then, does anybody know? How, the timing of this is, is what's unique and special with Dr. Klemyak's dream. Anybody know whose feast day it is on the first week of March when this happened? Once in a while I get a person that says it right. And you can't, you can't say if you're already on this tour before. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Very good, young lady. You see St. Catherine in the middle? St. Catherine died as a young man, 26 years old. Lived in the 1400s. What's remarkable about St. Casimir, if you read about him, is he had a strong dedication to the Blessed Mother. He used to recite a poem daily. He's buried with the poem. If you Google him, it says, I get shook up when I talk about this a little bit, because of the fact, when you read about his description, it says that St. Casimir used to come to church when he was a young boy, before it was open, when the gates were closed, and pray. And now the miracle happened. I know four families now that have experienced miracles since the church reopened because of their strong dedication to the Blessed Mother. So, happy day. Church is going to reopen. Dan covered it. Dan, by the way, handsome, clevelandpeople.com, doing a wonderful job covering everything in Cleveland. We had a wonderful mass here, 1,200 people on July 15th, warmer than today, <laughs> stuffed in this church like sardines, okay? And they all came because of the glorious news. Now, what was interesting though, that the plain there dealer, which wasn't so kind to us, did a lovely story the next day, on July 16th, 2012. You see, St. Casimir appeared on the front page of the paper, and not only that, which you don't often see of a public newspaper doing a religious story, but what appeared on the front page of the Plain Dealer, and this wasn't planned. It's the picture that Dr. Klemyak had his dream. It's the Blessed Mother that appears to all of us for the world to see on the front page of the Plain Dealer. See, so what I say to you today is this. The Blessed Mother said, do not leave me, do not abandon me. You are here today. We are so thankful of what's happened for this church and for the people helping us. State Senator Serino is here. He's helped us tremendously. And I'm just thankful that you're here. And please pray to our Blessed Mother because of the fact that she's done some glorious things for us. I've got to get back to the story about Walter and introduce Joe here. I can't end up the story about Walter just because he pulled the plug the bishop. He didn't more than that. <laughs> you see, Walter, thank God he got to live to see the church reopen at 99. And he came up to me in the hall and he says, John, John, 
in his broken accent. He says, guess who's coming to the church next week? Bishop Lennon. Bishop Lennon had to come back to the church to install Father Eric as our new priest. And Walter was so excited. So Walter came, of course, the following week, and so did I. He sat right there, the senator sit, standing, in his Polish uniform from 1944. He was still that thin and in good shape. He was a dancer. He was a ladies' man. <laughs> and he, Walter, was the first one to greet the bishop and to get communion from him. You see, the story is this. Walter fought for everything he believed in, yet he also did something very difficult. He forgave. That's why Walter was a hero to us. So Walter, again, got to see the church reopen. He lived and fought one more time to be 100 years old. He got sick in February the following year. And I'm going to let Joe finish the story about Walter as he knew him. Well, Walter oh, took a daily walk. He was close to 100. His birthday was in the uh, uh, beginning of February, end of January. And in December, he took a walk. He caught pneumonia. It was raining. Uh, he went to the hospital. And then the uh, water got in his lungs. He went to a, a, down, a step down unit because he was dying and the water was in his lungs. Uh, but in the meantime, Wash, uh, New York Times, LA Times, national news uh, agencies called me because I wrote some stories on Walter and they wanted to interview him. They wanted to talk to him. The plain dealer gave uh, one third of the page of the obituary to him. I heard people in the bank talking about the fellow, Walter. And uh, so I went to Walter with Wojtek, he was the other prayer leader, and Walter, these publications want to talk to you, uh, news media, do you want to talk to him? And he says, no, I don't want them to see me in this shape. He had oxygen tubes, but he was sharp. And I said, Walter, what can I tell them? He says, you tell them, and he went like this, you do what you can do, and that's it. And so I told, I called him all up, and he says, he doesn't want to be seen in that shape. Uh, one thing John didn't say, Walter was uh, from Grodno. Grodno's on the border of White Russia and Poland. And now it's part of White Russia. That was part of Poland before. Uh, part of Lithuania, part of the Polish Ukraine. Border ship, but the people still stay there. His wife and uh, son, he last saw in 1939 when he was called up. Then he was captured at Chistahova. Outside Chistahova, wound up in Germany, escaped, and then he was put in Bergen-Belsen, uh, heavy duty prisoner war camp where the Russian and Polish soldiers, and they were slowly poisoning there. So he spent the rest of the war there. Uh, Walter again was born in Grodno. Uh, St. Casimir died in Grodno. And, and he was, he's buried in uh, 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 Vilno, which the Lithuanians, the Polish Vilno, Lithuanian Vilnius, in St. Stanislaus Cathedral. So they didn't take his remains back to Krakow at that time, it was in the 1400s. He's buried in St. Stanislaus Cathedral. So Walter and St. Casimir had something in common. Same, same location. Walter was born there, his family lived there, and uh, St. Casimir died there. And, uh, uh, and then, again, Walter became a real folk hero. And because of him, uh, all of us are here today. When the, when the church opened up again, I'm, I'm a Broadway pole, I'm from another area of town. And John's family came here in 1913. My mother and her came with her parents in 1915, but in the other area, Broadway area. And so we have some in common because we're uh, both from Warsaw. And uh, uh, when the church opened up, we had everybody here. We were on the street for 139 Sundays. We had Catholics, we had Protestants, we had Jewish people, we had black people, Oriental people, Protestant, everybody was here. And they were all pulling for us. That's where I think uh, we saw the beauty of how good people stick up for good people. So when this church opened up, we were the leaders. Uh, and we were the leaders because John told you earlier, Dr. Klimyak had a dream that he saw the Blessed Mother. She comes in many forms. Lady of Fatima, uh, Lady of Guadalupe, and we have Lady of Guadalupe over there, and a, la a Lady of Chistova. She said, don't leave me. And we never left. We were there every Sunday, zero degrees, rain, snow, fog, ice. We came, a, a pouring rain, and we never got sick. And we were there for 139 Sundays straight. 
and uh, even Christmas time, uh, 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 Easter time, uh, Palm Sunday, everybody, and it came from all over. And about 11.30, and we, the other churches were following us. And that was the covenant. The Blessed Mother made a covenant, do not leave me. And we knew that she would never leave us as long as two or more were on that street. We wrote a letter to the bishop, Wojtek signed it, and he says, give us the keys. The Blessed Mother promised we're not leaving. If we have to be here 10 years, because you're going to lose. And he did lose. It was overturned. But that, they call that the miracle of St. Casimir. But the miracle of St. Casimir, I met one uh, a couple months later, uh, a year later, we had the first mass mob here. A fellow came up here. He was a Vietnam veteran from Our Lady of Mount Carmel on Detroit Avenue, Town Parish. He says, you're Joe. I was helping park cars that day. And, uh, and he says, he says, and he was wearing army fatigues. And he said, could you tell the people thank you? I says, for what? He says, so Vietnam, I haven't been in a church. I won't come in a church. But I watched this for four years outside. And he says, why am I not going to church? When you are fighting to get inside the church. He came here. Father Eric talked to him for about 35 minutes after the Mass. Uh, and I can't even remember his first name, but he came in his army fatigues. And then when John, when the church opened up, you know what John said? This is St. Casimir. Everybody says the Polish church. John says, yeah, it's a Polish church, but it's a church for all people. You don't have to be Polish to be here. You don't have to be Catholic to come here. We have Protestants even come here. We have a Jewish girl that comes here for all the holidays. Uh, we're, we're, you know, this is, uh, this is, you know, God's, this is God's holy land. A holy, holy space, and that's what we're here for. But John, the old organs still working. Yeah, See, and, you know, and, and, and today, you know, uh, to give you an example, we had some entertainment come from Poland, yeah. and I don't know if everybody knows, there's a problem with uh, for uh, two weeks now with computers and planes and trains and everything. They're still in route here. They were supposed to be here yesterday morning. So I spent eight hours on the phone trying to get back of people. So we have Tom Kretenich. He has a band, but they're playing different places today. He's in the hall, and, uh, and uh, I was calling for organists. There's a young lady. She's a uh, pianist. She plays all over the whole world. She's from Kazakhstan, Russian. She wanted to play here. Her husband's out of town with her car, and we'd have to pick her up. Well, we we're, were thin. So I called Walter, and he, he was in the band. His band sort of like plays once in a while. He came out, he played here 40 years ago. Yeah. He plays the keyboard. So he, 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 it was a surprise visit. It was homecoming for him yeah. to come here and play. So everybody pitches in over here, and we're just so glad to have everybody. And as John says, this church belongs to everybody. That cross over there next to John, John Paul II, they came from Mexico. Mexico, Mexico City. Uh, Mexicans brought it here. They believe they have a church in Mexico where John Paul visited when they had the revolutions going on in the world uh, when he became Pope because there was communist movements in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Brazil. John Paul went there. He says, why do you want to do that? I came, I came from a Marxist country. And they brought that, they put that here and they brought an uh, image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And today we have uh, the statue blessed by John Paul II when he went to uh, Portugal, the year after he was shot, he put the bullet in the crown of Our Lady uh, at the chapel, I think, and then he was leaving, and they, uh, there was a blue army. They just purchased a new image of Our Lady, and they were processing through the grotto, and he got out of his car, he went up to him and talked to him, and he said, can I bless her? So he blessed this statue. This is blessed by St. John Paul II. He was here in 1969. And he was 1969 in Cleveland. I went to the beach that day to play volleyball.